Okay. Good morning. This is Ron. It's a little after 10 a.m., so we'll get started. We've had some some awesome discussions the last uh, couple of weeks, I suppose, talking about history and who we are and 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 uh, kind of the the uh, the the, the uh, uh, trying to bring balance to the world and and what that means as far as our understanding of self and us collectively as a group. So uh, I would think uh, because of that, we've had, should have some questions this morning. I have one that someone texts me and I'll start off with this one and then see if we have any other questions, okay? But someone texts me a question in the middle of the week. The question says, when the Israelites or the Hebrews were enslaved in Egypt, who enslaved them? Was it the Africans or the Arabs? That's our first question. Um, there are two things there. One is at the time that the um, Old Testament was written, that was after the um, Kushite kingdom uh, in Egypt. What I mean by that is this. By the time that that um, the story of uh, the Egyptian, I'm sorry, the, of the Hebrews in Egypt, the northern a part of uh, Kush had been already overran. And they had, they mean in the Kushites had been pushed uh, down, uh, pushed south uh, towards the southern uh, part of Egypt. Of course, the area called Egypt was much larger than it is today. And that's where the Kushites took their stand and would not allow uh, the uh, northern invaders to, um, to push them further south. The northern invaders were uh, Euro Eurasians, um, and, and um, the Eurasians um, mixed intermingling or marrying within uh, the um, Kushite family. That's where um, the Arabs came from, the Arabs and the Persians from the from all those interactions or those. <laughs> So it right uh, during that period, it was the northern, um, the the people out of Europe and Asia, or and Eurasians who um, were in control of northern um, Egypt. So you're saying the Arabs would be what would have been the people. Yeah, <clears throat> I'm saying that that was at that time that was a mixture. Okay. That they had not ferried out, Arabs had not separated from what was called Egyptians, and um, there were still there were still Europeans, there were still European Eurasians, which means that Europeans and Asians who had intermarried, and then there were the uh, Kushites also who were there. So the, all those all those people in that particular area during that particular time <clears throat> were intermarrying. And the control was in the hands of um, the Eurasians. Now, whether the Eurasians at that period of time uh, were were uh, Arabs, uh, I, that I'm not aware of. But I do know that um, it was not uh, the Kushites who were there during that period, not in total control of the kingdom. Keep in mind that the uh, the, the era that's attributed to Moses having been in Egypt is an era uh, that is anywhere from 2,500 to 5,000 years uh, between the, the um, height of the Kushite kingdom and that period of time. Question? Comments. 
Um, but aren't some of the Arab people, don't they claim um, lineage from Ishmael? They do. Uh, they, they claim um, from Ishmael because of being in Egypt. And that's what I'm talking about. All of them were there in Egypt, in Egypt uh, during that period of time. Arabs, um, Eurasians, uh, Kushites, all of them were there during that period of time. But the dominant force uh, was, um, maybe there have been Arabs who was the dominant force in that area. When I think about um, Abraham's wife, um, what's her name? Couture. Uh, the one before Couture. Sarah. Huh? No. <laughs> Sarah's handmaiden. That he had. Hagar. Hagar. Hagar, yes. So, because Hagar was of royalty in Egypt, so very well have been the uh, the Arabs in charge. Okay. Thank you. Any, any questions about that? Anyone? Are there any further questions? Anything that we may have all uh, spoken of in the last couple of weeks or any question that you may have had from something that took place this week that, that caught your attention? Let me say something else about that, Ron, if I may. Yes, sir. Um, this was a period <clears throat> where we first begun to see the writings concerning um, Semites. But um, this is where the Semites, when we talk about Semitics, uh, Semites, we're talking about people who have, who are mixed race. And this is during the, that period of the Semites. And Moses was a Semite. So that is, that definitely speaks to what Audrey is saying about Ishmael. Well, yes, sir. Semites would be from the lineage of, supposedly from the lineage of Shem, right? Yeah, that's according to the writings in that book in the scriptures. However, um, when we look at uh, Shem, Hush, uh, all of these are not just individual people in the, in, in the writings of uh, the Old Testament. Uh, these are more conceptual in terms of uh, what they believed um, than, than it is talking about individual people. What happened is uh, the translators of the scriptures translated in a way that made it convenient for them. And what they did, they used um, um, Japheth, Shem, Cush, they used all of them uh, to create races. Not racism, but races, different people. Uh, so I, I want to be clear that I'm not talking about um, necessarily racism at that point in time, but they did divide the races based upon that. And if you go further with that, what you will see also is that the translators said that Cush was cursed uh, and that they were to be the servants of Shepheth for, for the rest of their life forever. So all of that is the racist translation of the scriptures. It, there's no mention, period, of anything pertaining to the Cushite kingdom unless you read in between the lines whether they tried to hide it. So, the, so um, what I'm saying in essence is this. If you read the translated Bible, it leaves a lot, a lot unsaid and is not translated the way that history actually happened. It's translated to suit are the whims of the translators. Questions right. coming? I'm sorry, go ahead, Ron. Yes, sir, I'm just asking the same question. 
Any 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 questions, anyone? Any follow up? Well, even if they say um they say they say Kush was cursed, but it wasn't I mean, right. even if you think that those were real people, it wasn't Kush, it was Canaan. Yeah, it was Canaan, the son of Cush. And, and and then if you read you if you read the scriptures continuously, you would think that uh, the Canaanites were different than uh, the Cushites. You can't have it both ways. Right. Because right. The, the, the Canaanites, the Chaldeans, all of them were, were Cushites, all of them. Um, all, the the uh, different uh, groups of people that are mentioned in the scripture, Pesach writes all those, all those Cushites. And, and, uh, if you, but you cannot glean that from the scriptures you glean that from, from the history of that area. As a matter of fact, um, the most concise place where I found that is recently, and that was in a book by Drusilla Houston, an uh, African lady who was born in 1896, wrote in, in 1926. But um, in, in that particular book, is, uh, you, you find a, a chronolog, pretty much a chronolog, as to the um, the history of, of the people during that era and a, a, an understanding of who all of the people who were mentioned in the scriptures, uh, whether they were Cushites or not. And from, from all of my readings uh, and understandings from what she chronologued, um, the Cushites were all of those, uh, were Canaanites and as I said, in Jebusites and um, uh, all of the people who were there, uh, in, who were mentioned rather, in, in uh, the uh, land of promise. So. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else, questions or comments? Um, I was listening to somebody the other day talk about this book called um, The History, I can't remember exactly what the name of it is anyway, but it was written by a guy named William Trotter. And it was in de defending why white people could have slaves here in the, here in the US. Um, and, and he was, backing in this was was written in like the 1800s sometime in the 1800s and he was um backing it up with scripture of why um um slavery was defensible and of course he took all his scriptures from like leviticus 25 and all that um but and he was saying how Cush was cursed to be slaves forever. And, and this woman was actually reading excerpts from the book. And, um, and it just gave me a real appreciation for why white, white Christians really believe that we are not, are not worthy to be equal citizens with them in the United States because um, they have, I guess they preached it for so long and the idea of us not being, of us being sons of Kush who were um, designated by God to be slaves forever. Anyway, I, it just gave me some new insight into their thinking, even though it's wrong. But anyway, it just gave me some new insights into it, which was really interesting. Anyway, it's a book by William Trotter called In Defense of Slavery or something like that. Okay. I, 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 uh, the name sounds familiar. I think I, it's uh, how to make 
how to make a Negro a Christian or something. I think he is a quote from him in that, maybe. Go ahead, Ron. No, I was just going to say that's uh, in the midst of where we are now in our discussions, all of these things are things that need to be discussed and uprooted. And uh, so, yeah, I'm I, I just glad we're bringing it up. Bringing it up. Because as you said, that's still a very much a part of all uh, the, the the religious or the, the psyche of some America. And uh, we see it every day. Yeah, very much so, Ron. I mean, yeah, yeah. they really believe that. See, that's the reason that they can be racist and not even know it. It's so deeply ingrained. I mean, for example, to tell me that that's not racist when a, when when um, a, a European tell me that something is not racist, how do you know? Uh, when I'm told that we want you to discuss your history, but uh, we want to start with uh, Frederick Douglass, how do you go tell me? Well, I should start with my history. And if I say that white folk have been doing this all along, and at some point uh, we have to stop this, now I'm the race, I'm playing the race card. Mm -hmm. So, so that I, I really believe that there are quite a few people, not all, who are racist and don't know it. And, and um, there have been there have, there have been um, flickers of that when we talk with the group from California. Some of the statements that are made that we have, you know, are, are, that we have made efforts to correct are, are statements of, of um, ingrained racism that have not been, has not been uprooted yet. Now, are we going to uproot racism? Uh, to be honest with you, my my. My uh, efforts are not to ever racism. My efforts are to make people aware of who they are. Because I can't uproot racism. To uproot it means that I can stop you from being a racist. I can't do that. You, you have to embrace the reality of who you are. And, and that in itself begins to make you more aware of the things that you say and the way that you present yourself in the midst of uh, people who have been the brunt of anger and, and racism if, ever since we came in contact with uh, Europeans. Now, one of this guy's arguments in this book Sorry, go ahead. Okay. Um, one of his arguments in the book was that um, <clears throat> because Africans were of such low intellect that they needed to be the only way they could be um, I don't even know the word but they needed to have somebody controlling them and helping them and teaching them so that they could join civilization. Um, and then he says, they're cursed by, because they're, this, they're the sons of Ham. But he, <laughs> he does, he just negates his whole argument by refusing to talk about, I mean, if these were people, refusing to talk about Nimrod, who was Cush's son, who, who built all these cities. So we can't build anything unless we have, we're being taught by them. And it just doesn't make any sense. Well, racism doesn't make any sense. Uh, nothing in this um, quote unquote world of democracy makes any sense. None of it makes sense. 
if it were making sense, it wouldn't be chaotic as it is. But chaos does what? Chaos speaks to potential. Potential for change. Potential for order. So in the midst of this chaos, we find the potential. And that potential is what we work with in order to um, make people aware of who they are. And that in itself began the um, journey of change. Hey, thank you. Did, did anyone else have a follow-up question? Yeah. I, uh, good morning, everyone. I don't have a follow-up question, but I just like to, um, you know, speak with regards to what Argy was saying. You know, again, it's just amazing that if we look at origin, our origin, if we look at beginnings, you know, and to see that, as it has been said in the past, you know, we were not slaves but enslaved. But the thing is, you know, look at how our ancestors were able to build, you know, the pyramids, being able to do all of the, you know, amazing things in terms of just what we were gifted to do. And again, for someone at a later time, you know, to have their interpretations in terms of without um, them, you know, we cannot achieve or do anything and I think is that is just good that we're looking at going back to look at history and what was the whole purpose of that being documented so you know again you know Audrey I, I you know again just appreciate and continue to um you know look at the world's oldest source of spiritual and moral you know instructions and I think that again as we have talked about it in the past, you know, we looked at, you know, the Ten Commandments or the Decalogue, or we looked at the Torah, the first five books of the law. But if we even go back further, I think that we can see that, you know, there were in terms of creation and what has been documented is just evident, you know, for us to appreciate you know, not only who we are, but what we were able to build as a, um, as a people. I just want to share those thoughts. I'm done. Thank you. I want, I want to ask a question too. Think about this. There are only two things that Europeans have tried to make us. Two things. They tried to make us slaves and they tried to make us Christians. Those are the only two things. Now, if we were, if our destiny was to be slaves, then why would you have to make me that, if you really believe that? If you believe that Christianity was a, a method of, of civilizing someone, then why would you have to, why would you have why would you have to make me that? Because if, if I'm destined to be that from creation forward, then I'm already that without you having to make me that. So what you're trying to make me is what you already are. You're enslaved to your own ignorance. And Christianity is the religious slash to you spiritual thing that binds you to your ignorance. So you're trying to make me as ignorant as you are as to who I am and as ignorant as you are in terms of my understanding who our creator is. And, and so, so uh, when you think about that, you have to uh, conclude, I suppose, that there is, if you are, if I'm already a doctor, you don't have to make me a doctor. I function like that. That's how I think. Does that make sense? So so and 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 um, 
that that's something I never really thought about until uh, just now. That those are the only two things slave make us believe we're slave and believe we're Christian, and both of them keeps us in bondage. And good morning, everyone. Um, based upon the statement that Miss Audrey uh, stated about how the European feels or uh, their maneuverability at the end of the day or the beginning of the day or mid part of the day is how you feel as a person. Um, European may have a certain belief of slavery. And what's scary about that is how we buy into it. Um, if I'm around a, an abundance of, or not abundance, but around African Americans, and it's just simple conversation, I know I may need the European to have my back in what I say. Because if they have my back in what I say, the rest of them Negroes going to fall in line. So in that, Joe, excuse European me. Excuse me. What, 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 what does that what mean? Does it, to, to have a European have in my back. What does that mean? Well, support my belief. Documented facts. Uh, okay. of, sim of, 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 of simple things. A, I may tell a group of African, A, hey, there's life on Mars. Not until the European co-signs on what I've said will the African-American, and this does not apply to all African-Americans. It applies to a few. So, you understand what you're saying? And I've heard, what was that again, Rev? I just say I'm the same now. And so, I mean, I'm 52 years old, and I know that this saying is older than 52 years of age. Sometimes you got to hear things in black and white. Um, so the, the danger of it is how do you feel about being an African American? Because there are some things in this Bible by way of Leviticus, um, and dialoguing with my aunt by way of marriage, Aunt Janet, we were talking about tithes and offerings. So I just said, the Ada don't want my tithes because I got a flat nose. Oh, blah, 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 you get into it. I'm like, that's in your Bible. Um, in the curse that came upon the people from the land of Cush. I mean, this is where we get our geometry from. So um, I just go back to how do you feel about yourself as an African-American? Um, how the Europeans going to gonna think? That is how they are going to think. And it's not all Europeans that buy into that concept. And it's not all African Americans that buy into the concept that we are slaves. But it's a good number of us, though. So uh, the best thing about where we are, we get to discuss things, dissect the scriptures. So however that European going to think, however your neighbor going to think, at the end of the day, it is based upon Ms. Audrey, how do you feel about being an African-American? I love being an African-American. It's the best thing on earth. And if I was European, I'd be saying the same. I love being a European. If I was Mexican, I love being Mexican. Yet as an African-American, I find great joy in being an African-American. I find great joy in staying in my community and doing things to aid my community. So, Ms. Audrey, my question to you is, how do you feel about being an African-American? Thank you very much. Uh, based on what I know now, great. <laughs> um, when I was growing up, it was hard to feel like you were accepted as a person. Um, so I have some traumas and dramas from that, but um, I've pretty much worked all that out of my system. Um, 
So at the place I am right now, I'm great. Um, I want to speak to this about buying into slavery. Sorry? I want to speak to this thing about having been bought into slavery. The majority of Africans did not buy into slavery. The greatest number of Africans who bought into slavery <clears throat> bought into it during the Civil Rights Movement. Think about that. Prior to the Civil Rights Movement, the overwhelming majority of Africans did not buy into slavery. The shackles were there, yet the African did not embrace slavery, and the majority didn't embrace slavery. When the shackles shifted from the wrists and the ankles, it enslaved the mind. And that enslavement of the mind became more prevalent during the civil rights movement. And that, I do believe, that's what prompted Martin Luther King to say that his greatest regret was leading his people into integration. The assimilation of the civil rights movement, because it wasn't integration, the, the assimilation of the civil rights movement said that the uh, clothes that were sold by the European were better than the clothes that were sold by us. Uh, everything that the European said that it was in terms of um, wealth, desire to be wealthy, the the uh, the cultural way they lived, all of that. I mean the the um, the cotillion where wealthy white people brought their children to meet each other and kept them together so money could marry money. Um, we have the uh, African uh, Jack and Jill thing that uh, mimics uh, that same principle. We are more enslaved now than we have ever been. That, that's my response to that, George. Um, I don't know how, how else to say that, but we are more enslaved now than ever. And, the, and what we are enslaved to is money. Once the mindset is convinced that money makes you, uh, makes you strong, that money gives you intellect, that money uh, makes you acceptable, that in itself is self-imposed slavery by the choices that have been made. And we were taught to accept this type of slavery during our years of education, especially when there, when there was a division made between those who quit school and those who completed high school those who completed high school and those who completed college. These are divisions were sold to us and we bought them. And I, I remember very clearly those who were um, adverse to what we were doing during the period of civil rights and nationalism, uh, African nationalism, Pan-Africanism. They were totally against all of that until it became popular to be black. Or uh, when, when, when Caucasian, when European, when white Americans uh, acts, uh, uh, embrace the idea of African American, that's when we embraced it. And to this day, there are very few of us who embrace the reality that we are Africans. Without the flat, without the American being attached to it, and I remind you 
James Baldwin says, an African is one without memory. An African-American is one without privilege. So that still holds to this day. And if we think that we have privilege in this nation, then that's, that shows us how deeply uh, we have been indoctrinated to be to remain uh, to uh, hold on to this attitude of enslavement. Thank you. Anyone else? Questions, comments? Okay, do you have any questions or comments about anything? Doesn't have to be uh, where we are now. Uh, let's let's look at Barbara. You about to say something? Uh, I I want to comment about something you uh, you said before. You said that paraphrasing. You said that. Um, how can you know what balance is until you see imbalance? It's something along those lines. And so what I guess the implication is that all of the quote unquote imbalances we're seeing now are, are, are ways to let us know what it looks like so that we know how to balance it. Is that is that reasonable? Yes. We, so that we know what needs to be balanced. Yes. Yes. And get, and, but it's twofold also now that I think about it, Bob. Not only do, does it show us what needs to be balanced, but guess what? We just know what balance looks like based upon what was needing to be balanced. But do we not? Is is that not part of the knowing thyself kind of thing? You gotta, you yes. got, you gotta know what both are, in in order to um, uh, be able to deal effectively with the imbalance. So if I if I didn't know who I was, and what who my essence was, there's no way that I could deal with the imbalance to the extent that it needs to be dealt with. But that also explains why other people can't either. They don't know themselves. And so uh, instead of getting mad at how can this person say this, we have to understand I, it goes back to the, the forgive them kind of thing. They know not what they say or what they do or how they act because they really don't know themselves. And if they really knew themselves. So I guess I'm saying all that to say, I understand what you mean by um don't worry about racism. We're not here to necessarily fix racism. We're here to um, help other people know themselves. And then if they know themselves, they will do what they need to do to quote unquote, deal with all of these uh, isms and schisms um, from, their, fr from, from their own perspective. Yes. Yeah, that, that that's definitely um, what I see. I also see something else. Um, we knew in part who we are based upon seeing that we are Elohim, but I don't think that we really began to see what that really means until we started to see where we came from, what we were from the beginning. And in seeing that, I think there is something else that um, uh, that's extremely important when we talk about balance. Uh, Ron called, uh, called me during the week and um, said that um, he felt strongly that we needed to look at the 43 laws or the principles, or however you want to call it, of Mayan. And immediately, I felt what he was uh, expressing and, and what he had experienced. And I do believe that we will not be able to bring balance 
until we balance ourselves. And I don't believe that we will be able to balance ourselves if we don't know what the origin of self-balance is. If we are to truly know who we are and to embrace the beginnings of our existence, then we all we also obligate uh, to embrace the we are also obligated uh, to embrace um, the balance that we were introduced to at the beginning. And that balance is found in the um, 42 Laws of Mayor. And, and I understand now the reason uh, that um, Shabaka or King Shabak and those before uh, uh, King Shabaka insisted, demanded uh, that obligated everyone to read those forty-three, those forty-two codes, those forty-two laws, every twice a day, because of the power that was in them, reminding us of what balance looks like. So I, I um. I, I really, I, I think I'm grateful that Ron was listening because we would have been in another direction and <clears throat> we would have been off this journey a bit from that we had been traveling. Then the, from understanding our origins from a spiritual perspective leads us to understanding <clears throat> how to remain focused spiritually. And that's another way of saying how to remain in a state of balance. Does that make sense, guys? Uh, yes. So <clears throat> with that, um, I think there are things, uh, there are, there is rather a preamble, so to speak, uh, to looking at those 42 laws. And um, I saw that uh, when, um, when when Aron called and asked me to read page 178 in um, Spirituality Before Religion. And what he saw there, I think it's a preamble uh, to our looking at these 42 laws. So if um, there are can I do something for the pastor? Yeah. So something something Barbara said and you answered to that that, that showed me something. Um we we don't recognize, I think maybe now we're recognizing the strength of desire. Do you re, do you realize in the pursuit of truth or the pursuit of religion anywhere in the world, this is the first time true desire has been used in that pursuit? Religion doesn't desire this. He, he says, how do I know uh, uh, unless one teaches me? He's talking about desire. I want this. Religion doesn't move self out of the way. Racism doesn't move self out of the way. Uh, 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 accumulating wealth does not move self out of the way. But what we're describing, what you're describing is, I want this so bad that I'm willing to shrink away. I'm willing to move self out of the way to become whatever I need to become. That's the strength in what we do. So I, I'm, I'm disagreeing with what you and Barbara said, but I, I'm looking at how strong desire is. It, it, it's, it's, it's chaotic and as imbalanced as Barbara said the world is, you don't embrace it until you desire balance. And, and, and in desiring balance, it obligates the universe to move in our favor. And, and, and that, is, that is what has brought us to the point where we are now. Uh, we, we embrace that obligation by becoming one with everything that the universe shows us. So 
this 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 journey and and, and we, we i think you know I, i've said i heard past say i like where we are now in, in other words we're embracing we're feeling the rhythm that we're in the vibration that we're in based on where this thing started and where we are now and and recognizing that i'm in the stream and the, and no matter how fast the rapids go i know i can't drown I can only go the speed I'm supposed to go because I am the rapids and the rapids are me. So I just, just the, the, the imbalance is, is being shown because we have revealed it. And, and all of this is, is at the, at the place it's supposed to be. I'm just agreeing with what you guys say. You know, the majority of what we have been talking about over the years, was not so much for us to understand as much as it was for us to be disciplined to that to the desire that we have. And that discipline has brought us to this place where we can listen at where, where our origin is and see it from a spiritual uh, through a spiritual eye as opposed to having to um, see it through the eye of um, religion itself. Uh, discipline is, disciplined desire is of utmost importance if we are ever uh, to, um, to, to know who, who we are and our mission in this earth. I'm done. Barbara Jean, you are, you are muted. <laughs> I was just going to say what Ron was saying was that, you know, we, we've talked about if you really truly want, if you really truly know something, you become one with that. And as Ron was talking about, okay, the stream is taking me every kind of way, but that's okay. I, 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 I'm, I am just flowing with the stream. That That's the uh, example of the principle of, uh, knowing and understanding who you are and becoming one with it. So whatever happens, it is you and you are it. And, and you know, also Barbara, you know, when we speak of our Mayot or people, some people say Mayot, um, that was the whole concept of the mother goddess in terms of having us to understand that the ultimate aim was to be one with God, to, to be Elohim. And in the principles or the seven principles that, that was given to us in terms of the spiritual and moral teachings of the ancient uh, people this is uh, something that we have an opportunity, like again, to go back and, and and revisit in terms of what it, you know, truly means in terms of our cultural rights, and, and the passages in terms of those, uh, the forty two laws, you know, that was given us, or the forty two laws when we talk about um, our our declarations or things that we shall, you know, should not do but it just gives us a foundation that we can hopefully begin to appreciate in terms of how do we understand it. And so to be able to go back and look at the order where we can find union with the gods or the or, or Elohim from a higher spiritual perspective. So if, if this was, what was given to us, and we have the opportunity to not only revisit it, but being able to understand it from the highest, from a higher self perspective. Um, you know, this is again something that I just you know really feel strong about because as we talked about the scriptures, we know that that this is the world oldest spiritual and moral instructions, and so if this predated going back to 5,000 years before the common era, when we talk about the twa and going through that evolution where we're coming from the Menphite theology, coming to the Shabaka stone, understanding in terms of our history, 
you know, there's just substance that's in there that I think help us to do a comparative analysis, you know, where we can begin to appreciate what does uh, these seven principles mean. I think we can talk about the 42, you know, laws of ammunition. I mean, in terms of the 42 laws of Maya, but I think that to understand the seven principles that the goddess Maya has given us, you know, it, it just makes us to really discern what is truth. And I think that if we take a look at that, we will begin to maybe have a better understanding of truly what balance means, what truth means, what harmony means, what justice means, what reciprocity means. And so again, it's just having us to go back to appreciate, you know, what does the scripture really say? And again, something that just came back to my remembrance in terms of something that again, Audrey said, I mean, the Bible said, obey your slave masters. But I think that whole scripture in terms of how it was interpreted or how people may have used it for their own selfishness or their own greed or own whatever those things are that are negative um, uh, declarations. I think that we need to, again, revisit and to talk about that. So I just think that we're in a good space and time, Ron, as you say, to be able to appreciate, you know, what are these principles teaching us, you know, what is the, uh, the, the feminine deity, you know, uh, yeah. saying to us that's nurturing us. And now how do we look at it? You know, when we talk about balance. And so if Maya, the goddess Maya was, you know, the feminine energy, you know, then when we look at it in terms of the masculine and we, you know, talk a little bit or pass you and Ron, you probably can, when we talk about Thoth, I believe it's Thoth or Tahuti. And I can recall when you guys were in Philadelphia and we went to the bookstore, you know, there was a book that I think Ron, you was looking at, I think Pastor looked at, talked about Thoth, T-H-O-T-S. But again, at that time, I couldn't even resonate yeah. in terms of, man, yeah. why are you picking up that? What is that? But now that we're talking about it today, I can see it more clearly and factually in terms of what is the meaning you know, of these principles. And so I just wanted to share those thoughts unless anybody have any questions or comments. Hey, hey George, I, I think that may have been the universe trying to tell us, pick this book up. You're going to need it down the road. You may not appreciate it now, but we, we had no idea of some of those books we were looking at at the time. But yeah, you're exactly right. I, I, I did want to ask you a question, though. You mentioned several times the seven principles. Do you think they need to come first before we endeavor into into the, the the 42 principles or which order because this is your wheelhouse which, which, which order you think we should look at here because you mentioned the seven principles did you want to go into that first Roy, uh, George before yeah, we do before you we go into that <clears throat> let's go into that with the, the mindset mm -hmm. okay. excuse me um God, the creator, did not become a man until the writing of the Bible. Prior to that, God was feminine. Mm -hmm. and, and the reason God was feminine prior to that is because... <clears throat> Only God can give life because God is life. Only a female can bring life into this earth. Feminine energy is, is God because it brings life. So when we start talking about these principles, then let's talk about these principles from the mindset of femininity. Okay. Because all of these principles speak to the ideas and concepts that we that the expectation is for us to receive from the feminine influences in our life and to be undergirded by the masculine influences in our lives. Yeah. So with that mindset, let's approach it. Okay. I'm, gonna, I'm done. I just want to say that. I'm going to I'm going to get off uh, I'm uh, my Zoom is dropping 
bits of what you're saying. So I'm going to have to just call in so that I can make sure I don't miss anything. Okay. All right. I am. Let us know when you're back in, Barbara. Okay. Yeah. I am. One of I'm sorry, go ahead. I was I laughing when you were talking, Pastor, because when George was talking and he was talking about um, justice and all that, all that other stuff, I was in my head, I was going, God is a girl. God is a girl. <laughs> <laughs> this is Vermel. Um, I'd like to say, Ron, thank you for bringing up the four laws of my eye, because um, I've been reading this week and thinking, there's no way I'm understanding this. I can't wait till we start talking about these. So I want to thank you for bringing up that suggestion. Okay. And and, and please, I, I appreciate you saying that. Uh, I encourage you or anyone, if, if we, because we talk about a lot of stuff. And if we, we need to slow down or, or, or talk about something else uh, to, to bring it, bring clarity, please feel free at any time, at any time. And that's, that's anybody here. Uh, George sent me a book I know over a year ago, and I picked it up and looked at bits and pieces of it, but I'm just getting to where I'm excited about it uh, after all this time. So we, 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 we all see things differently at different times. So, but yeah, I appreciate your saying that. And, and, if, and if we go, as we continue into this, is there something more or something a different way we need to approach it let us know okay I did. barbara i'm back yes thank you yes ma'am okay barbara um anyone else before we proceed hey, I got good morning everyone oh miss barbara miss or do you mind if i go first if you don't mind hello go ahead george go ahead Okay. One of the things that Reverend Richard stated was um, how we make money or currency our God. And that is something that I really think that we need to give attention to, because if we don't have financial literacy out here, the likelihood of understanding feminine energy, masculine energy, uh, is going it, it could be very difficult um three brothers i know that can really teach some financial literacy number one being tim smith beckett craig richard three roy Pinkney. we have to get into this concept of if you don't understand money trust me Everything else you encounter is going to be difficult. Um, reason why I believe that Earth, Wind, and Fire generation, all the way back to Cablon, is doing did a lot better than my generation. They had uh, they had more knowledge of financial literacy than my generation. My generation, we do anything for money anything for money compromise our integrity don't tell the truth especially when your paycheck is close to your truth you ain't gonna never dominate this here world when it's like that so it's very much opinionated we need to discuss financial literacy when my era will ensure an apple phone and not put an insurance policy on them, something wrong with our mind. And like I say, I'll stand on it and I'll let it go. You ain't going to understand nothing Mr. George saying if you don't understand how to work money. You ain't going to understand anything about feminine energy, masculine energy, a cable on until you figure out money ain't nothing but a tool. So at some point in time, it don't have to be today, Ain't even got to be this year. Need to discuss financial literacy and how it has an impact on how we view things spiritually. Thank you. Yeah, we've already <clears throat> approached that. Money has destroyed us spiritually. And um, it wasn't that we 
of other generations were financial uh, literate. It was that we understood that we were not only our brother's keeper, but we also were interdependent on our neighbors. It wasn't about money. And if we don't understand who we are, we can talk about financial literacy all we want. It's not going to do any good. None whatsoever. It has zero value uh, in our spiritual life. Uh, when, when we understand who we are, everything begins to fall into place. So uh, I, I understand what you, the efforts that you're making to talk about financial literacy, but I, I, um, I don't see it having any effect in a positive way without knowing who we are. That's it. Uh, I have a comment. Uh, when we discuss the um, principles of Maya or the, the laws of Maya, we're going to be talking about that. Inc that's inclusive of money. That's inclusive of of, of 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 reciprocity and and righteousness and all of that stuff, uh, because money is only one aspect of that that whole thing. So these principles will teach you how to deal with the material kinds of things. Thank you, sweetie. The material kinds of things um, in a balanced way, and that's what it. That's what. That's and, mo and money is just one of the tools. Thanks. George. Okay, great. Okay. Oh, I I I agree with everything everyone has said. Um, I just know once I got a good grasp on money is just a tool. Things just started opening up for me about who I am, um, learning about masculine energy, feminine energy. Uh, so that was that's just my experience. Uh, thank you very much. You're welcome, sir. Brother thank George. you. Yeah, are we good, Pastor? Yeah. Okay. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, when we speak about um, Mayat or Mayat, you know, the goddess Mayat is the embodiment of all ancient Egyptian seven principles. And so I believe what has just been said, that this will incorporate finances, all that exist. And in the seven principles, um, I just like to look at it, you know, a little bit in terms of just uh, discussing each one. And I know that probably today, uh, Pastor Ron, I sent a text to you. I, I probably will not be able to get through all seven, but uh, at the same time, again, I like to start where we are. And at the same time, you know, again, um, we all are teachers. And so I know that, you know, we'll be able to get through what we need to. But looking at the first principle, it talks about truth. And I believe that all that we have been discussing things that have been uh, shared, these words have already been spoken in the macro. You know, there and, and words have power. So we know that when we talk about balance, we talk about harmony, we talk about order, but I'll just, just go in the order in terms of um, how it's listed. And so the first one talks about truth. There was a movie uh, that Jack Nicholson played in, and I think he had played a uh, military officer who was uh, very distinguished and he was in a courtroom setting. And what he basically said that came down to the bottom punchline was, you can't handle the truth. And that kind of stuck with me in terms of, you know, just being able to try to understand, you know, what he was saying, but looking at it from this principle and perspective, it says that truth is the ability to understand the difference between what is real and unreal. And that, uh, you know, kind of made me reflect and think a little bit, because again, you know, what is real to us? What is unreal? And I think as we begin to look at history, we begin to look at where we are, you know, in our evolution of spiritual consciousness, you know, to be able to discern that 
you know, it, it's something that, you know, we continue to pray for, you know, in our spiritual evolution. But it also says, you know, and again, and I'm just, you know, reading from this principle, it says that, of course, this is the subject to the definition of reality. But in this interpretation, it says reality is grind, grounded in the belief of the greatest goodness that which permeates all that exists and that all living creatures are sacred and all of our spiritual beings deserving of respect and honor. So when we talk about, you know, our existence and our love for compassion, or we talk about the importance of um, being, you know, who we are as Elohim, you know, we also talk about the importance to know. And in the Hebrew, the word yada, Y-A-D-A, talks about to be certain, to be aware of, to, to, to instruct. And I think that we're going through this transformation now in terms of us truly beginning to accept, you know, what the goddess Maya was saying to us through the teachings of these principles. And so I just wanted to, you know, start with that one that talks about truth. You know, what is the truth? And I think that we, you know, again, pastor and everyone on the call talked about the Bible as being literally you know what I mean? What we accept as truth. But I think in our continued discussions and our continued prayers and meditation, we are beginning to understand that there's, you know, there, there's the process that sometimes the truth is distorted or it may be uh, given to us in a way to create division to create separation. But if everything originates from the beginning and we know that the laws of Mayat is the oldest um, world's, you know, um, instructions on spirituality and morality, then what does truth mean to us? So I just wanted to, you know, maybe see if there's any comments or questions about what we perceive as truth to be, or at the same time, again, do we have a better understanding of how to discern this for the purpose of us being able to be the light and the energy that we are, that we can bring a sense of truth to those that seek the truth. And I know, again, we've talked about it from the beginning, you know, that if you're open to the truth, you know, then, you know, just hear it, see it, smell it, use our senses, our perceptions, our conception of what is truth, and now let our intuition be what it needs to be as far as how we continue to evolve. But are there any questions about truth or any comments? Or, or does this resonate with everyone in terms of what truth means to you? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree with you. And I love the way you, you started off or you, you said the ability to understand what is real and unreal. And, and I think that's the separation right there. Uh, we have been taught to believe that uh, what is real is something that brings us the reward or, or what something that we can readily see and, and uh, put our hands on things that are tangible. And what has been our reward if you think about it from where we are, the people on this phone, what is your reward for being here every week, three times a week? What 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 is what is all what what has been the thing that has improved us, has has moved us forward, has kept us coming back? So it is not a tangible thing that we have seen. It is not something that uh, uh that that is going to bring us wealth or a higher status. But but uh, just to to uh, the understanding who you are and the reward, if you will, is that energy, that that feeling, that rhythm that we have in the universe, uh, with the universe rather, and the 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 closeness that we feel with our Creator and the understanding that we're gaining, and the 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 the, uh, the responsibility, if you will to to be the one that stands uh, 
at the bottom of the totem pole for mankind. That is what's real. That is our reward. And, and I'm sure you can all think of it in your own words, but uh, the, 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 the thing that, that is real to me uh, is not going to be pursued by most people because it, it has no, no, no true reward to it. So um, that, 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 that stands out to me when you said that. Okay. Uh, um, any or if I could just add to that, Ron, and I think you said, George, it struck me when you said that reality is grounded in in the greater good. Is yes. Um, I mean, that really struck me because in my just basic reading of the forty two laws. Um, it's all about the greater good um, and you can create your reality based on, on, on that. But I'd like you to expound on that a little more if you could. You're on mute, George. You're mute. All right, thanks, Harvey. Yeah, when I think about the greater good, is not looking at just what is my purpose for living. You know, what is the purpose of us living with regards to humanity? And if it's being able to bring loving kindness, bringing the fruits of the spirit to those that come into our space or come into our uh, aura, you know, then it's about the greater good of being the light, the love, the energy that we are that can bring a sense of balance and harmony. So when we have the opportunity to go about our daily lives, each morning we have an opportunity to appreciate and be thankful for what we can do for, I want to believe for the greater good. And so when we come into contact with humanity, you know, being who we are, you know, that's, you know, I think the joy that I have, that we have to be able to look at chaos, to be able to look at things that we might feel that is impossible. But we know that again, all things are possible, you know, through the spirit of who we are to empower someone else. So the greater good, what is the greater good? And it's not being selfish, it's being able to give, you know, in a way that, um, that someone else can be happy. And maybe I can give an example. Um, this week, you know, at work, you know, there was a Hispanic young man um, who just recently had a child. And he's in a position where he has to balance life. You know, he has to have a job. He needs to take care of his child. But one of the things that really gave me joy in terms of the greater good is to be able to see him get his high school diploma, to be able to see him to have his baby in his breast, on his breast, seeing the baby smile, being able to, you know, experience the joys of life that sometimes can be the total opposite when we're not in a positive place or space where we can appreciate the greater good, the greater goodness. And so I think that that was just an example for me to look at the greater goodness to see that, you know, the, the, the spirit or the human being that he is, you know, being able to bring the greater good in someone else. So I just look at that as an example. But I think, again, it's like us being on the call today. You know, when we talk about, you know, being grounded in the belief of the, you know, of the greatest goodness, you know, what is our desire? you know, in terms of us being able to empower one another. And they say that the proof of desire is in the pursuit. You know, what are we pursuing? And so that's kind of what I, you know, what I'm feeling, you know, already when we talk about the greater goodness that which, that which permeates all that exists. And so just to be in existence, just to have this divine breath, we have an opportunity to, um, bring up the greater good. If that resonates, I'm done. May I add to that? Sure. Um, 
it is written that um, as the as the gods have care for humanity, so must humans care about the humanity and the earth that has been provided with. Meaning that uh, the greater good, as I see it also, is um, making sure or doing everything possible for humanity to know who it is, which means that it will result in bringing balance to everyone. And the whole system that was in place in the kingdom of the Kushites was a system that reinforced uh, the, the greater good for everyone. And as we read or uh, through or as we look at those 42 laws, we are going to be introduced to what Mayot has, has shown us to be the greater good for humanity. Uh, and when well, the, I, I talked about Mayot being a feminine, also a tomb is the masculine of Mayot. So when we know what the greater good is, that's the wisdom of it. The act of it is, is, is masculinity, mean carrying it, make to and defending it, not defending it in terms of a war, but defending it by virtue of answering questions, bringing clarity to everyone about how we are to um, interact and respond to each other in the same way that um, the Creator respond, responded and responds to us, so must we be the same for humanity, which results in balance. I'm done. I have a comment to, as well to add, please. Um, uh, George was talking about what truth is. And, 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 and George, uh, I would add with, to what you're saying, but you've already said it in a different way, that it, the truth is that we are one with all. That's, that's the bottom line for me. The bottom, and, and so when we talk about greater good then, that, that, that's part of the principles of Maya, the reciprocity thing, you know, treat others as you would, would have them treat you or uh, what is done to me is done to the other or I, as, you, you, as you often quote, I am because we are and we are. Um, because we and we are one. So what is done to one is done to the other. All of that wraps itself into what the greater good is. The greater good is that I don't think of myself. I think of the other, the other, whatever that is. Uh, and so we're going to find probably that these principles all intertwine with themselves to undergird the truth of our connectedness with each other, that we are one. Uh, with each other and with all things. Absolutely. Thanks. Yes, absolutely, Barbara. And I think I know we have, you know, maybe mentioned this or talked about it before, but the African proverb, uh, Ubuntu, you know, speaks about the importance of I am. And in this uh, proverb is exactly what you said, Barbara, in terms of I am because we are, and we are because they were. And since they were, therefore I am. And if you look at, you know, the Bible in terms of the Moses story, you know, where Moses, you know, um, was on the Mount Hor Horeb, and um, I think he asked Jesus, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, he asked God, who shall I say I am? And so when we talk about the power of I am, you know, that's just like an affirmation or declaration, you know, for me personally, because again, you know, I am that I am. But what I guess is in my spirit is that when I sometimes write, I may say I am GRC, 
But I think the significance of that for me is just simply saying I reverence who I am. And then, you know, my name, George Robert Clark. Now, as I began to understand and appreciate who I am, it talked about the importance of oneness. So what you said, you know, again, Barbara, is exactly, I think, a, another way, I guess, of saying it for me, but I believe we all understand that we have the power through the I am's that we are. And so the two most powerful words, you know, in my opinion is I am, but what do I put after that? Or who do I say I am? And I think that we're coming more to a appreciation as Elohim that who are you? And that what gives us, you know, I think the power to uh, change things. In, in, in the word, in the principle of truth, it says that all living creatures are sacred. And so, again, I know that there's a Bible scripture that says, let everything that have breath praise ye the Lord or give praise. And so sometimes I think we, we, we take for granted who we are because we don't realize how wonderful and marvelously we are made. And we can look at it in various aspects of so, be, so above, so below, but coming into that awareness, coming into that knowledge and I truly believe that this is the appointed time that we needed to be discussing um, world history or discussing our beginnings because we're receiving now in the spirit how sacred we are. And it says that, and all spiritual beings deserve what? Respect and honor. That's the greater goodness. Respect and honor. And, and, and can we sense that can we feel that for all of us who are on, on on this call you know the respect and honor that we have for each other you know and as past always says you know we we all are teachers in in various ways in terms of wherever we are wherever we are positioned to in a place of our occupations or our um uh, vocations but we are one yet many and um, I wanted to just share those thoughts. Any comments or questions? Well, uh, one thing I like to add, Mr. George, and that movie you were talking about was A Few Good Men with Demi Moore, Jack Nicholson, uh, and Tom Cruise. Um, and a certain aspect of truth, it may start out as the minority. Then... It may never reach its potential where it is the majority, yet it can start out as the minority and it gains momentum where people will buy into it. Um, the one thing that I do like about truth is it doesn't need a kickstand to stand up. If what you're saying is true and is documented and you can prove that, you don't have to do a whole lot of neurotic coupling to get people to buy into what you're saying. Um, so when some people can't handle the truth. Yeah. Um, so that's just the aspect of truth. It may start out as the minority, yet it gains momentum where someone will buy into what that truth is. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, George, I, I appreciate you sharing that because, by all means, let me just say, family, when I, when I, you know, took a look at the forty-two laws of uh, Mayotte, man, I, I, I got some pinches, pinches, pinch, pinch, in terms of just knowing who I am, but more importantly, wow, you know, there, there's a, there's a, um, a ammunition that's written that says that I will not turn from words of truth. I will not turn away, I'm sorry, I will not turn from the from words of truth. And that's a powerful, that's a powerful um, law. And as I'm saying, you know, when I look at this by no means, and I'm always in an attitude of, of, of acts of forgiveness, I'm always in an attitude, you know, of, of appreciating you know, being able to be renewed, to be restored. 
But I mean, these are some these are some laws that, you know, again, if I can just have a better understanding of and have a desire to 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 evolve, you know, that's the blessing where I'm at today. You know, because I mean, something that sounds so simple can be so hard. But I think in my yacht, it talks about like a scale. There's a, you know, there's a, um, there's another proverb, but it talks like about a scale, 50-50, good and evil. You know, and your decisions that you make tilts the scale. And so I think, you know, being able to, you know, appreciate, you know, uh, God's goodness or being able to appreciate the greater goodness that we are grounded in, it helps us to be able to sometimes um, get, you know, to grow through a situation that we might seem impossible. So I don't, again, as I say, I don't know where everyone else is, but I think it's something that, you know, we should uh, look at in terms of a principle. But um, I think everybody deserves respect and honor and um, and not totally just being judgmental because it's not about a, a race a race thing. You know, it's about a humanity. And I truly believe that there's one human human race, you know, and, you know, and it all started, you know, as, uh, you know, George mentioned in his pastor and everyone mentioned in terms of um, uh, our Kevalon. So, you know, that's where I'm at with truth, unless there's any other questions, uh, Ron, uh, pastor, anyone has about that, because I don't want to go into, like I said, I, unfortunately, I have a family obligation, but more importantly, um, I just want to make sure that um, we can pick up or whatever we need to do, Ron. Um, I would appreciate just your, your assistance. Let me say this before. Um, okay. Yes, um, sir. Tr truth. You said I would not turn from the word of truth. That's with the understanding that you have to know what the word of truth is from the beginning. And um, when we talk about things resonating, uh, that's because the truth is being embraced by a deeper, a deeper source. Um, shall I say, being embraced by our soul rather than our minds? And, um, the reason we live in a world that is not a world of reality is because um, the truth has been hidden for thousands of years mm -hmm. and now is being birthed again as it was from the beginning is being birthed uh, from the womb of mayot from the womb of femininity and from the for, and from the um attuned the maleness the the masculinity embracing uh, the life and, and the um, the truth that's being birthed by femininity. Uh, okay, Ron. Yes, sir. Any, any questions or comments? Oh, thank you, George. Anyone? I like to read something for you, unless you guys. Do you think this is a good place for pause, or, or what do you think? What, what, where do you guys think? Um, this, I'm going to cast for pause. I'm, I'm, I think that we've said a lot. Okay. And um, a balance is going to be a lot more in depth, in depth than the truth was in terms of discussing it. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, Tell you what, then it's about eleven thirty. So yeah, we've had a good discussion. Any thoughts or question before we get off the line, though? Anyone? Great discussion. And again, I encourage you, please, if there's something that was said that you don't understand, like, uh, uh, I, I I loved it when when uh, Audrey went back and asked asked George to talk about the greater good. If there's more that you want to elaborate on, with, let's let's do that. Okay. And I encourage you also to send me a, a text message if you want, or uh, if you have something you don't want to say over the line, just just send me a text or pastor, any one of us, and, and we'll read it and uh, we'll discuss it, okay? 
but we want to make sure everybody uh, everybody gets this, that, that we're all here together. Great discussion. Uh, if there are no more uh, questions or, uh, or to, to be asked, I hope you have a great day. I hope you got something from this. Listen to the, the uh, video, if you will, and uh, look forward to seeing you tomorrow morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank everyone. You. Thank you, family. Bye, family. Okay.